So yeah, basically what we have here is the most powerful dedicated Android handheld system to hit the market. And I'm seeing some really great performance out of the new Razer Edge. What's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at the brand new Razer Edge handheld Android gaming system from Razer. This is the Wi-Fi version. They also make a 5G version. And when this was initially announced, I did a video kind of showing off the specs over on their website. And at the time, the Wi-Fi version and the 5G version were listed with 8 gigabytes of RAM. But as it turns out, the Wi-Fi version only has six, and they didn't fix their website until a few days after a lot of people actually started receiving these units, so uh, that was definitely a big disappointment, but it didn't persuade me from canceling my reservation. When it comes to emulation, native Android gaming and cloud gaming, six gigs on this device is going to be plenty, and really, one of the main reasons I wanted to get this was the CPU. It's utilizing a Qualcomm Snapdragon G3X Gen 1, and when it comes to these Android handhelds, it's the most powerful chip we've seen so far, so it should put down some really great performance. And I'm super excited to test this thing out when it comes to native Android gaming and emulation. Of course, it's going to handle cloud gaming quite well. It does have Wi-Fi 6 built in. And basically, what we have here is the tablet portion of the handheld. That's what they're calling it over on their website. It's got a 6.8-inch AMOLED display at 144 hertz. And this also has active cooling built in, so uh, we shouldn't see any kind of thermal throttling with that new Snapdragon chip. Now, of course, this is touted as a handheld, so the controller is actually located here. They include a Razer Kishi V2 Pro, and basically the tablet portion of the Razer Edge kind of just attaches right in here over USB Type-C. And I've always been a big fan of these Razer Kishi controllers ever since they released the very first Razer Kishi. I've also got the V2, but the Pro here isn't much different as far as I can tell right now. I will do kind of a comparison in just a second, but let's go ahead and unwrap the tablet portion of the unit. And yeah, this is actually a lot smaller than I thought it would be. I figured it would be a bit thicker given that we do have active cooling here with that Snapdragon G3X. But uh, overall, looking pretty good. We've got USB Type-C. It also supports a micro SD card. We've got our volume rocker, our power button, and uh, dual stereo speakers on this unit. Let's go ahead and get it booted up for the first time. And as you can see, I mean, it's got some bezels. Now, I actually thought that these would be a bit thinner. They don't bug me as much as they do some other people. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you're already using, let's say, a Galaxy S22 or you've pre-ordered the S23, all you'll really need to put something like this together is one of these controllers. You can buy the Razer Kishi V2. There are other expandable or stretchy controllers on the market that you can pick up. I'll leave some links in the description. The tablet portion of the Edge does have a really sleek design. I kind of like the way they've got this set up. Got a bit of a rounded back here. We've got easy access to the power button, volume buttons, speakers on each side. And around back, we've got some ventilation for that built-in cooling system. Like I mentioned, it does have an active fan inside. But once you slap it inside of the controller, we do have a really nice looking handheld. Now, it's not much different than putting your phone inside of something like the Razer Kishi V2. And speaking of that controller... The design hasn't changed much when it comes to the new Pro model that comes with the Edge, but there are a few key differences. With the Pro model, it's got built-in vibration motors and a 3.5mm audio jack down here. So uh, yeah, I mean, there are some differences, but the Edge will fit in the original V2 if it ever came down to that. Over on Razer's website, it doesn't mention anything about quick charging this battery, so I wanted to test it out. I've got a watt meter here, and outside of the controller, the Edge can charge at close to 30 watts. We're right there, 27, 28, I'm just going to call it 30. But once we place it inside of the controller and we use that pass-through USB Type-C port, it's going to be cut in half. 15 watts maximum fast charge on the internal 5000 milliamp hour battery. Getting right into the operating system, this is running Android 12, and there are a few pre-installed apps. Obviously, we've got the Google Bloat, uh, Google Drive, and things like that. We've also got a few Razer apps and some pre-installed Razer wallpapers that you can choose from. But uh, it is Google Play certified, so we've got full access to Google Play. And of course, you could use it without Razer Nexus, but I personally do like using this. I actually have it installed on my main gaming phone right now also. Plus, with the uh, newest update, we do have controller mapping software for the Razer Kishi V2 Pro, which we have here, and the original V2. But it gives us some recommendations on different games and applications to download. Plus, we can launch them directly from here. Now, if you take a look at the very bottom, 
We've got a little toggle here, and this is going to be our virtual control. We can enable this per application or per game. That way we can go ahead and map the controller to games that don't natively support controllers like Genshin Impact. We can redefine the button layout on the controller itself, and with the pro version of the Razer Kishi V2, we do have that Rumble built in or dual vibration motors. We can set the intensity from here. We can also update the firmware. I'm fully updated right now. But in the end, I mean, if you've ever used an Android tablet or an Android phone, then you'll be right at home with this device here. We can install third-party launchers. We can install different applications like Netflix. There's nothing really stopping us from, you know, using this as a full-fledged Android tablet or phone without 5G. The first thing I wanted to do was take a look at a few benchmarks, and I kind of faced this off against the Snapdragon Gen 8 1 and the Gen 8 2. On the far left-hand side, the Razer Edge. Single core, 1132, multi, 3269. I've seen some Gen 8 1s, you know, benchmark right around here, but uh, as you can see, what I've got in my inventory right now is beating it out when it comes to the Gen 8 1 and especially the Gen 8 2. Moving over to a GPU benchmark, we've got 3D Mark Wildlife Extreme on the Razer Edge 1432. Now this has fallen far behind the Gen 8 1. I ran this several times on the device. I let it heat up, I let it cool down, and 1432 was the best score that I could pull out of the Razer Edge. Now it's time to see how the Edge handles native Android gaming, and we're going to start off light here with Minecraft. 16 chunks, and we can reach 120 FPS with this game. Got a few dips into the low 90s, but overall, really great performance. And the controller here just works with games that natively support controllers on Android, but you will run into some games where you have to use the built-in mapper, like Call of Duty and Genshin Impact. Unfortunately, Call of Duty only supports first-party controllers from Xbox and Sony, so with Razer's new mapping software, we can actually get it working with basically any game. And we're at high right now, running at 60 FPS, you can play this all day long. And I really didn't doubt we weren't going to have an issue with this game here, it's very well optimized. So let's move over to one of the hardest Android games to run, at least at high settings, 60 FPS, and that's going to be Genshin Impact. I'm not sure if we're ever going to get official controller support for the Android version of Genshin Impact. It would be nice to have it, that way we don't have to do any kind of mapping, but luckily, through Razer Cortex, we can go ahead and map these on-screen touch points, and it makes it really easy to play this game with the controller. Super easy to set up, fully customizable, and you can enable this per game through Razer Cortex. So far, been having a really great time with this, and uh, yeah, I mean, right now, we've just mapped the controls for Genshin Impact on-screen we can use the built-in controller or the detachable controller. Running this game at 60 FPS, high settings. At maximum, I can't really get a super stable frame rate at 60, but if you don't mind playing it at 30, you can go ahead and max this out. High still looks really good in my opinion, and it's fully playable on this device. I mean, I'm getting some really great performance at a Genshin Impact on the Edge. When it comes to native Android gaming on the Edge, I mean, basically, as long as you can install the game, it's going to run it at full speed. Some of these higher-end games, you might have to drop it down to high, but we're getting great performance. Next thing I wanted to test out was some emulation, and we're going to start off here with Dreamcast. Not a super hard system to emulate, especially using the ReDream emulator. Right now we're at 1920 by 1440 with Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and I figured I'd take time here to test out this D-pad. If you're familiar with these Razer Kishi controllers, you know, for the D-pad and the main buttons it uses micro switches, in my opinion, it would have been really nice if they used conductive pads instead of micro switches, but I think they've done a great job with what we have here. Pulling off these special moves is really easy with the Kishi. And since we're here, I figured that we'd just go ahead and test out one more Dreamcast game. Sonic Adventure 2, 1920, 1440, running at full speed. FPS is up in the top left-hand corner, and I knew we'd have more than enough power to emulate these Dreamcast games. As long as the game's compatible with the emulator, be it ReDream or Flycast, it's going to run it at full speed. So let's go ahead and take it up to PSP using PPSSPP, 5X resolution, Vulcan backend, Tekken 6. I consider this a mid-range game to emulate, and of course, we're at full speed. FPS with this is in the top right hand corner. I know it's a bit hard to see, but even at 5x with this game, didn't have any kind of dips whatsoever. So let's test out a harder game. This is kind of our go-to test, Chains of Olympus. Still using the Vulcan back end, we're at 5x resolution, no hacks on, running absolutely amazingly on the edge. So seeing how well it's running this game at 5x, the easier to emulate stuff can go up even higher, but it really doesn't make much sense, you know, taking let's say Tony Hawk up to 10x on this device given the screen's resolution. 
But, uh, you know, it's really nice to know that we can do it if we wanted to. The next thing I wanted to test was some GameCube emulation using Dolphin Emulator. OpenGL back in, and I'm using the development build from the official website. This isn't the build from Google Play. We've got Automotalista, which is a harder one to emulate, running great. So this OpenGL is definitely where it's at right now with the Dolphin emulator and the Snapdragon chips. They've done a lot of optimizations with it. But if you wanted to go over the Vulcan for some games, it may help out. I also tested out F-Zero GX on the hardest track to emulate, Firefield. Uh, when you go into this with an Android device, make sure you definitely test out this track here because a lot of the older devices definitely fall on their face. But with this here, we're at a constant 60 and I was really surprised by this. Just checking out the benchmarks, I didn't think we'd get this kind of performance, but it's definitely trucking right through. And the final GameCube game I wanted to test here was Rogue Squadron 2. So if you do any kind of GameCube emulation, you know how hard this can be to emulate, even on x86 platforms. On the new Snapdragon Gen 2, I can actually get this to run at 60 FPS with the OpenGL back end, but unfortunately, as you can see, we do get a bunch of dips here with this game on the G3X. And of course, we had to test out some PS2 emulation, but uh, keep an eye on the channel because I will have a full emulation showcase video coming up using the Razer Edge. There's just a lot more that I want to test here than could be fit in this video. But here's Ether SX2, 3x resolution, OpenGL back in with Kingdom Hearts 2 running at full speed. Not a super hard game to emulate, so let's take it up just a bit here to Gran Turismo 4. Still using the OpenGL back in at 3x running at 60 FPS. Looking good so far with PS2 emulation using EtherSX2, and with everything that I've tested so far, I haven't even had to swap over to the Vulcan back in, even with games like God of War 2. Now I will admit that at 3x resolution, when there's lots of particles on screen, this does dip down, so you might want to take it down to around 2.5x resolution, but so far, I mean, emulation is looking very solid on the Razer Edge. Full emulation showcase video is coming up, got some Switch, some 3DS, Sega Saturn, all systems like that will be included in that video, and if there's anything specific you want to see running, just let me know in the comments below. Now there is one last thing that I wanted to show off. This is actually really important to me when it comes to my gaming Android phones or higher end Android devices, and that's kind of display over USB type C, otherwise known as alt mode. This monitor does support USB type C video in, and we can go up to 1440p. It's a Pixio PX27 Pro, I believe. I'll leave a link in the description, but you could use a dock or an adapter. You can pick them up on Amazon for a pretty decent deal. And unfortunately, we don't have a great desktop mode here. You can enable it from the developer settings, but it's very bare bones. So I'm going to kind of experiment with that. But we do have at least screen mirroring. And while we're using a wired connection like this, we have zero latency. So if you did want to connect to a larger display, you could always do it and run something like an Xbox controller connected over Bluetooth. So first impressions here, I do like the layout. I know some people are probably going to be bugged by the bezels on this uh, tablet device right in the middle, but we do have more screen space than most phones on the market right now, given the aspect ratio of this AMOLED display. For a dedicated Android handheld, it's definitely putting out some really good performance, but you know, when you compare it to newer flagship devices, phones that you might already have in your pocket, then it is lacking, at least at the time of launch. I was actually expecting this, at least in the synthetic benchmarks, to kind of match up with the Snapdragon Gen 1. And unfortunately, in those synthetic benchmarks, it looks like it's falling behind. So uh, hopefully we do get some more optimizations down the road with firmware updates, because I know for sure that this chip does have more to offer. And by the way, through all of my testing, I was in performance mode from the battery settings in Android. This is not a Razer feature. It's uh, on all Android devices. If you head over to your settings, battery, you can turn performance mode on. Didn't make much of a difference, but I was hoping it would. And speaking of performance mode, there's really no dedicated hardware settings here. So we can't control the built-in fan. We don't have kind of an eco or balanced or performance mode. So hopefully that's added in updated firmware because that could definitely help out a lot of people. But just going into this device as a dedicated Android handheld, it's definitely the most powerful one we've seen so far, and I can't wait to see what firmware is going to do down the road with this. But that's going to wrap it up for my first look video at the Razer Edge. I've got several videos planned, so keep an eye on the channel. Next one's going to be a full emulation showcase. We've got a lot to test here. 
But until then, I'd like to know your thoughts in the comments below. Is this a device that you've been interested in? Is this something that you're going to pick up? Have you pre-ordered it? Is it too expensive? Is it not putting out enough performance? Let us know in the comments below. And if this is something you're interested in, I'll leave a couple links in the description. But that's it for this one. And like always, thanks for watching.